reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply. Reach out. This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 1 and 2, the King's beginning. As we know, there are four Gospels, and they tell the same story from different points of view, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's been observed that Matthew is a Jew writing to Jews about a Jew, and he wants to emphasize the kingship of Jesus, that he is to be the king of the Jews and the Messiah. And so he has a lot of Old Testament quotes about the coming Messiah. There are about 312 Old Testament quotes about the Messiah, all of which are fulfilled by Jesus. So with Matthew, you're going to see Jesus as the king. Mark, on the other hand, is gonna talk about Jesus as the servant, the suffering servant of God. Luke, a physician, is going to talk to us about Jesus the man. And John, of course, in his wonderful gospel, talks about Jesus as the son of God. King, servant, human being, God, Jesus Christ. As always, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for these words that we're about to read and study. We ask that you give Pastor Jerry wisdom as he brings forth your truth and power and truth and really disseminates what is in the Word of God and helps us to understand what you want us to learn from this. Help me, Lord, to maybe uh, apply Uh, This application helped me to give examples of application that could be pertinent and real to our real lives. We ask that you work in the hearts of everyone so they would hear and then apply it into their own lives, Lord. Because we we are individuals and you can we can all hear the same message, but we can take different things out of that message because you know us individually. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, we ask you to anoint us, every one of us here. We ask the Holy Spirit to come and anoint us now. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. There's a lot going on, as Kelly had made reference to. Um, uh, I'll be teaching. Kelly's going to help me. She's going to make application. The Holy Spirit's going to be talking to you individually about things that I'm not even discussing. That's happened before. People have said, what a wonderful message you gave, Jerry, about this or that. I never said a word. <laughs> so uh, the Holy Spirit's working. There are angels here, we know from Scripture. And yes, there are demonic spirits here as well. And so this place is packed, even though there aren't that many people here physically. But this place is packed. There's a lot going on. But one one thing is going to last, and that's the Word of God. This is a gospel written by a tax collector. There was nothing more hated in Jesus' time than tax collectors. Has their reputation improved over the years? (laughs) No, No. because we complain all the time, right? (laughs) Absolutely. They were tax collectors. Harlots were not looked upon with favor, but guess what? If you wanted a better reputation than a tax collector... The harlot had it. Prostitutes were not in such low regard as that. Today, if you want to go ahead and Google the most popular profession as far as people having a high regard for them, do you know what the highest profession is as far as popularity? People have the most respect for? Nurses. Nurses. Oh, I don't know. It's starting to diminish. (laughs) Right after (laughs) nurses, below that, about 85% of people trust nurses. It is true. Right after nurses, you know what the most popular profession is as far as trustworthiness? Teachers. Teachers is right. That's right. And you get into the 60s, it gets on down to uh, uh, the uh, 
Pastors, guess what that is? It's just barely 50% of the people trust a pastor. How about that, huh? I'm a pastor and that's not so encouraging. What's even less discouraging is I'm also a lawyer and, well, as Don Gossett used to introduce me to his, his audience, he'd say, now I want to introduce to you a liar, I mean a lawyer, and uh, that popularity rating was down below that, but at least See I'm See what not, you have to deal with, Ben? I'm not at 5%. Guess what profession is it? 5% of the people trust them. Politicians, right? And uh, I don't know who the 5% are, maybe their spouses. In any event, nobody, nobody trusted a tax collector. Jesus brought him on board as a disciple, and the Holy Spirit has given him the honor of the first wonderful a gospel that we have. He wrote but somebody has to AD. do the jobs. Someone's got to do the work, right? Well, I have tried to make my life, and my, life, my wife's life easier, but there comes a time once in a while when I have to really make it difficult. And now is the time. She is going to read <laughs> I'm like, verses one. He didn't through, inform me of one this. One through seventeen. <laughs> it's, oh, you. Oh, I don't. And I'm going to correct her. No, you're not. And guess who's going to be right? <laughs> Who knows? My father used to say. Why don't you read it? Pastor Moore <laughs> used to say, as far as pronunciation, if someone says that's not how you pronounce it, in the village where my family came from, that's how we pronounced it. Sam tells me, as my professor in seminary said, your Greek is not so good. Well, he learned it in Thessalonica. I learned it in Albany, New York. So uh, anyway, uh, let's go ahead. I've and, done um, this a number of times and messed up some of it a number of times. <laughs> you go right the important thing in pronunciation is you say it fast. And I love to hear my Old Testament teachings because I can mention a name and about Two minutes later, I mention it again, and about five minutes later, again, and each time it's, it's totally different. different. So, uh, trying to please everybody. Uh, why a genealogy of Jesus Christ? He's starting off with a genealogy because you need to know that Jesus Christ has the authority to be king over Israel. Only one who can trace his lineage through King Solomon to King David has, has the authority to be the king. And why King David? Well, God made a promise to King David. David had one time wanted to build a temple for God, and God said to him, no, you're not going to build a temple for me because your hands have shed blood, but your son Solomon is going to uh, build that temple, and he made a promise, a covenant with him in 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're not going to read all of it here, but this is the authority that we have for the king of Israel. He must come from King David. He must come from David's son, Solomon, who was also king. That's the line of kings down through Judah. And uh, the, here's the promise when God says, no, you can't build the temple for me. Uh, in verse 12 of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we read, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. The one from his body will be Solomon. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The throne is going to be initially for Solomon, but it's going to be forever through Jesus, a descendant of Solomon. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. Solomon. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as they took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. And that refers to Jesus Christ. So Jesus must trace his lineage back to King Solomon and his father, King David. God has no problems. But if he had a problem, it would be this. He has chosen Mary to be a virgin who will bring forth the child, Jesus. And Mary, we, don't, what, we know very little about her except she was a woman of faith. She was a disciple of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, a, a wonderful woman to be sure. Not her fault, but her lineage was almost perfect for this, but not quite. She can trace her lineage back to King David, but not through David's son, Solomon. Solomon's brother, Nathan, is her ancestor. 
So Jesus Christ is not entitled to be king of Israel through Mary. God has no problem, but if he had a problem, he'd say, I've got to find somebody who's going to be the legal guardian of this young man who can trace his lineage right back to David through Solomon, who, had the kingship continued in his day, would have been perhaps king of Israel. I found the man that I want. His name is Joseph. This is the lineage of Jesus' stepfather and legally considered to be his legal father as far as the law is concerned. Jesus is entitled to be king of Israel because of not Mary, Joseph. Very interesting. And this is this genealogy, we could spend weeks on this. It's fascinating. Now, that's very time. interesting because of the stepfather. Do you see how that... Stepfather. And stepfathering, of course, I'm a stepfather to Veronica and other kids as well. Stepfathering, there's a whole ministry about stepfathering. Stepfathering pictures our relationship with God through Jesus Christ better than anything else because none of us as believers are natural born children of God. Only Jesus is. We're all stepchildren. We're all adopted by him. So step parenting shows God's relationship with us. It also pictures on earth, hopefully, a relationship where uh, somebody voluntarily says, I'm not legally obligated, but I choose to be a parent, a provider. And you had such a man in your wonderful father, Sam. I had a wonderful father, stepfather named Mort. Uh, God bless you, dear. And so step parenting is, is a wonderful thing when it's done right. God bless us. And for, you have to enjoy uh, those moments because exactly. when they're gone, they're gone. Yep. So uh, step parents, you're important. We appreciate you. How many are step parents here? Anybody? Yeah. Look at those hands being raised. Look at those hands. God bless you. Hallelujah. All right. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. We need to go back to uh, David. Let's start with verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot uh, Amenadab, Amenadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed, Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her, who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Amon, and Amon begot Josiah. Josiah begot a Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot um, Sheltiel, and Sheltiel begot Zerubbabel, I forgot that one, Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begot um, Abiad, and Abiad begot uh, Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azar. Azar begot Zadok, Zadok begot uh, ah Achim, Achim, and ah Achim, Achim begot uh, Iliad. Iliad begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Mathan, and Mathan begot Jacob. Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Hallelujah. She did well, didn't she? Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. That, that's torture. Um, but uh, it's important because we need to establish that Jesus is legally right, uh, uh, allowed to be the king of Israel. And uh, nobody else can come in after him because all these records are, are preserved here, but all the records otherwise were destroyed in the fire 
in 70 AD when Rome under Titus came and destroyed Jerusalem. So nobody else could come in today and say, I'm the Messiah. Oh, they do. You've said messiahs are popping up all, all over the place, but um, only this one is the true lineage. So back to verse one, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, that's the most important thing. He has to be the son of David because to David was given the promise he would be king. And of course, from Abraham, the father really of Israel. Um, and Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. We know about that. Jacob, of course, had uh, the, uh, the 12 sons who become the 12 tri heads of the tribes of Israel. Uh, verse 3, Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. That was a very interesting story. I was looking at a picture before service of Norman Rockwell's painting, family tree, and it's very amusing. And when you get a chance, you want to Google it, not, not now, but uh, later on, just, uh, good, just put in Norman Rockwell, family tree. And he has this wonderful portrait of this little boy who is just so, he must be a Sunday school kid, he's just so angelic. And uh, he's got parents, and I'm showing it to Kelly here. And they, the, the parents are just all American, they're just so clean and pure and they look like something out of the 1950s movies of Mother mm -hmm. and Dad. Now you look at her lineage, and oh, we got a, we got a cowboy who looks kind of menacing, and we've got a dance hall girl. Uh, on the other side, we've got, uh, on his side, we've got a nice looking upstanding uh, businessman and a very fine lady. The parents. Yeah, and her, the, her parents were uh, a very stern looking uh, pastor and his, his wife. On the other side was an Indian and a cowboy, and then it goes on down, and we finally end up at the bottom, my favorite here. It starts with a pirate and uh, some lady of the night and uh, what have you. So it's the family tree. And that's uh, my family tree, and that's your family tree, and that's Jesus' family tree. We've all got some interesting people in our background. So let's not throw stones um, because Tamar was lied to by Judah when she had tried to... Uh, uh, marry him because she had married his sons and they all died and so he was afraid of her but uh, she went ahead and posed as a prostitute in order to get uh, the, the children in any event uh, she did that uh, we have uh, verse 4 ram begot aminadab aminadab begot nation nation begot salmon he's an interesting fellow he's a jewish fellow he's there at the time of their conquest of jericho and uh, you remember how there was a prostitute in Jericho who hid the spies and mm -hmm. showed them how to safely get out? What was her name? Rahab, Rahab. Rahab verse 5. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. So here is a Gentile prostitute who has a faith in the God of Israel, and Salmon marries her and has a man named Boaz. And Boaz becomes important to us because Boaz marries Ruth. Now Boaz, because his mother was a Gentile, was not afraid to go outside the family tree, so to speak, and to marry a Gentile because Ruth came from where? She came across the river from Moab. She was a Moabitess. And so he marries her, that wonderful story of Ruth in the Bible. And they have a son named Obed. Well, Obed is important because he has a son named Jesse. And Jesse is important because he has a son named King David, or named David the King. So now David, of course, is uh, the king of Israel, and Solomon follows uh, David, and that's important for us. Uh, we mention here that uh, David's life was not perfect, even as mine was not, uh, nor yours. And... Uh, they had a child out of wedlock, and that child died a couple of days later. They had three uh, other, they had four other children, and um, uh, David wanted to cover that up, didn't he? So what did he do? He murdered her, her husband, had her husband Uzziah. murdered, Uriah. Uriah. Uh, Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, Abijah Asa, Asa begot Jehoshaphat, a very godly man, very godly king, and uh, look, look forward to, to uh, uh, reading about him. And then there's Joram, and then there's Uzziah. And Uzziah is a very, very godly king, but he's a little ambitious, and he's king, and he violates a very important principle. A king is a king, and a priest is a priest, and neither of the two shall be in one person. He tries to be a priest. David was smart enough not to try to do that, but Uzziah was dumb, and he went into the temple to try to offer a sacrifice 
The priests try to shove him out and say, no, you can't be here because you're the king. Get out. And he broke into leprosy and uh, he was a leper until he died. Because of the Old Testament, it says no one can be a priest and a king. That's right. Except there was one priest and king. That's right. And who was that? You know who that was. And that was about, it was Melchizedek, wasn't it? My Melchizedek fav- in the my Old Testament. My favorite story in the Bible. Melchizedek was prophet, priest, and king in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, we have Jerry Lynn. And lest we think that he has become delusional, every believer in the New Testament has that ability to prophesy. All believers are priests and kings, according to Revelation 1. And so through Christ, you and I are a kingdom, and we are kings in his kingdom, and we are priests, and we can so prophesy. So you can prophesy, you can pray, you can do, so all, you can those do all those we things. We used to go to them for that. That's right. But now we can go straight to the throne of God through Jesus. Amen. Well, Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham Ahaz, and then Hezekiah, wonderful uh, uh, fellow. We all know about Hezekiah because what did he do? He was sick, and Isaiah gave him the word, you're to die, and what did he do? He cried. And he prayed, and God gave him a little more time. How much more time do you have? 15 years. Testimony time. He was healed of his disease. And incidentally, how was he healed? By figs. Talking about healing coming from plants and fruit. And what? Healed by figs. Great news. He's healed, and he has a little baby boy. And the baby boy's name is Manasseh, and he'll become king. He'll become the most wicked king in Israel. Aren't you glad you lived 15 more years to have that monster? And so Manasseh is so bad that God singles him out and says, Judah is going to go into captivity, yes, for their own sins, but particularly the sins of Manasseh and also Solomon in his backslidden state. Solomon, I thought he was so wonderful. So yes, wonderful. he started off so well, didn't he? And then he ended up being backslidden by his 1,000 wives who lead him astray. So Solomon goes from very spiritual in Proverbs to rather backslidden in Ecclesiastes to being so wicked he is called out by God as one of the two most wicked kings sending Israel into captivity at the hands of Babylon. So, so when, you, when they, when goes they look from, at Israel today, you can understand... If you know pieces of this, you can understand what poor Israel is going through. So you look at Solomon, he's wonderful, my money's on him, it's going to be great. Don't judge a book by its cover, give it a little more time. My grandfather used to say, we shall see what we shall see. So he ends up going from good down to bad. Manasseh, the most wicked king of all. He's taken into captivity by Assyria, they put a hook through his jaw, drag him off, and what does that sucker do? He calls out to God, and he repents, and he asks forgiveness, and he becomes saved. And God puts him back on the throne, and he spends the rest of his days leading people to love and respect Jehovah. So he goes from bad to absolutely superlative. So God can take a wicked, wicked person. Yeah, he can change. He can change them. Very interesting stories. A lot lot of us, we could go on and on about these people. But this this is our lineage. Yeah. Yeah. So when the people say, gosh, that person's such a bad person, you better think about, well, I don't, he, he is. But we don't know what God's going to do with That's him, right. so I better zip my mouth up. That's right. I was telling some of the young girls I work with, I you know, attract young girls who need mentors in the nursing field. And I said, you know, one of my old, my old bosses, one of my managers, you remember Evelyn, who came here, she used to do this to me. Because I wanted to, you know, pa, 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 pa. and now I'm doing. That's right. I'm doing this to them, and I'm mm-hmm. like, wait, just wait. So it's not our job to judge, but I'll tell you that person over there is a super spiritual person. We should all be like that person. We shall see what we shall see. We hope for the best that it continues. And that wait. bum over there, that is the worst individual. That person could never be saved. There's no hope for that individual. Well, Let's pray. People can change. God is a miracle-working God, too. He's a miracle-working God, He's a miracle-working God. So you just simply uh, trust in the Lord and just look to Jesus. and uh, There but the grace of God, there go I. Exactly, exactly. Well, um, Hezekiah, he got his wish. He got a baby boy. And Manasseh was wicked, but then he turned towards God. He had a son, Ammon. And then uh, Ammon came along and had Josiah, who was very spiritual. 
Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers at the time they went into captivity. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel. Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. He is important because he is a governor who comes back and supervises the building of the temple along with Joshua, the high priest. And with the help of several of the uh, prophets, he is encouraging the people to build the temple again that had been destroyed uh, when uh, Babylon came to destroy it. So he is a very important person there. That's what the, he's the one that God spoke to and also Joshua. Don't give up, guys. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Zerubbabel begot Abiud. Abiud begot Eliakim. Eliakim begot Azor. Azor begot Zadok. And Zadok begot Achim. And Achim Eliud. Eliud begot Eliezer. These are not names that are important to us. They could have been kings had the kingship continued uh, and would have been kings perhaps. Eliad begot Eliezer, Eliezer Mathen, Mathen begot Jacob, and here it is, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So, first thing we know about Joseph is he's got the impeccable lineage, could have been king, could have gone right back to being, if, if, if they had a kingship, Joseph could have been king of Israel. That's the man that God chose to raise Jesus and to become his legal guardian. In those days, <clears throat> it was the stepfather who would become, if there was no father, the stepfather was the legal uh, one that had the legal right. My stepfather adopted me and uh, I became legally his son and uh, with equal rights of his daughters. But uh, Joseph was the legal guardian and was the... And when a father, um, when a man died, didn't he go to the brother if the brother... The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, if the brother yeah, That's could. the problem we have with Tamar. Right. Uh, they, they have to... Uh, with Boaz. Yeah, they, they, go, they go back to... Uh, you have, have to marry your... your um, if, if, you're, if you have, have no family, you marry your wife's... Uh, brother. Your, your, your brother's uh, wife. Your, br uh, your brother-in-law. Yeah. But if he's married or if he doesn't want to, then... And that's what happened with Boaz that's there. With, with, uh, with, uh, with Tamar. Tamar. Et cetera. Now, Jacob begot Joseph, so Joseph is very important to us, and uh, he was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. Mary's lineage, if you want to read that, uh, is in Luke chapter 3, and it's also very interesting, but you'll see that she goes back to David <coughs> through, as I said, Nathan, <coughs> and that's the wrong, uh, the wrong line. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 <coughs> generations, David to the captivity <coughs> in Babylon, uh, 14 generations, captivity to uh, Christ, another 14. Actually, there were a few more generations there, but they limited it so that uh, people could, uh, kids could remember <coughs> these things. And incidentally, when you look at this wonderful list of people, uh, and you ask, who do the Jews really revere? My, my, my stepfather was Jewish, raised as an Orthodox a uh, Jewish uh, person, became a believer, became a pastor. And I said, uh, who do the Jews really respect? And he had a thumb, his thumb on the Jewish community. He said, is it David? Is it Abraham? No, you know who the Jews really respect? They look to their father, so to speak, Moshe or Moses. Moses is the one they really, really respect. Not David. Christians get all excited about David because of his psalms and a wonderful spiritual example. But don't forget about Moses. The Jews consider him to be their daddy, so to speak. And uh, as I'm getting older now and getting more into natural lifestyle instead of medicine lifestyle, um, I'm looking more to Moses all the time and how he lived. And uh, the key to Moses living was a hey, God gave him 120 years but he kept moving, he kept moving, simple diet and uh, all kinds of activity, a lot of headaches. That'll keep you young, I'll tell you, a lot of headaches. Two or three million people complaining all the time, that'll keep you young. So, uh, all right, chapter uh, one and look at verse 18. Let's get into the birth of Jesus now. And this is gonna talk about uh, the, uh, how God is uh, handling this situation. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed or engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. That is earth shattering. That is amazing. Here is the birth of Jesus. She is engaged. In those days, engagement could be anywhere from age two or three years of age. Two kids getting engaged, 
to maybe a year before the actual uh, wedding. In any event, they were engaged. And the engagement was a very serious proposition, more than it is today. It was a legal relationship. And as a legal relationship, it could be only broken by divorce. If you were engaged and you broke it off, you were having to do it by divorce, not just simply throw the ring back and walk away. And so the betrothal period was, had to be at least a year. Why? They understood biology in those days as we do today. We want to make sure that young lady who's coming to the wedding is a virgin. And one year will tell you whether she in fact is or is not. And so they were engaged. And if the young lady were to slip in the relationship and have a child be pregnant within a year, then the husband-to-be would pretty much have the obligation and certainly the right and privilege to expose her, to bring her before charges that she's had a child out of wedlock while we were engaged. And what is the Old Testament penalty for that? She was to be stoned to death. That's what's on Joseph's mind. First thing we saw about Joseph is he has the impeccable lineage, could be king, certainly provides kingship for Jesus. Secondly, as far as this man himself is concerned, he no doubt is a virgin. He is engaged to a virgin who is now no longer a virgin. What is he going to do? What is he going to do? Take her before the elders, have her stoned to death. Obviously, he cared for her deeply. That's his predicament. Before they came together, she was found with child. And here it says the child was really of the Holy Spirit, God himself. So let's pick it up. Do you feel I'm going to continue? Uh, you got a little frog in your throat? Yeah. You want some water? Okay. I think I have, it was my fault. I worked her too no, hard I have on all to, those all right, names, I was going to say what happened, but Veronica made these really good meatballs. It's her fault. No, no, this gets better. <laughs> and just before I left, I said, is there any salt on these meatballs? Yeah. She said, no, not much at all. I, just a tiny bit of garlic salt. So then I said, all right, I'll have one. Well, I had two. It's your fault. But she had them seasoned with other things, and something got in my tooth, and it loosened from my tooth. I felt it, and I swallowed it. <laughs> And it was hot. See that? See in our family. And I brushed my teeth before I left, too. The solutions to all problems are easy with our family. Just blame it on Veronica, right? <laughs> all right. I'm like, Veronica, what'd you put in those meatballs? <laughs> Save some of those for me. I love them, okay? <laughs> they were good. All right. They were so delicious. Make sure she doesn't eat all of them. <laughs> okay, so we've got a problem here, haven't we, huh? Uh, Joseph, so let's pick it up with verse 19. Then Joseph, her brother, being a just now, let's man. Try, let's, go, let's try that again. Then, um, <laughs> then Joseph, her husband. You caught that. See, they, they called, uh, in the, the, the engagement period, they called it a husband. And let me just finish that to give your throat another yeah, yeah, minute. Uh, in order for us to, we won't get into to chapter two today. No. Um, the, uh, the pattern of uh, a wedding in those days, and Jesus follows this with us in the church in Revelation, is that the engagement took place at any time <laughs> the kids were born. Could be age one or two or three. But obviously it didn't happen until they were of suitable age. And then the engagement period had to be at least a year. It was a betrothal. They called them husband and wife, even though they were not actually legally married. But during that year, the young man was to prepare a house or an addition on his father's house if they couldn't afford a whole new house. <coughs> and so during this year, we can imagine that Joseph was making provision for Mary to come into the home, they would marry, and then they would have a child. Can you imagine the joy and the expectation that he had? How excited he was about this during that year? And I'm sure that year was just flying by for him, and he was hammering those nails and putting the addition on, and just, he was so excited. And then he gets this news that she's pregnant. And this has to just cause him to be so in despair, so <laughs> discouraged. And he doesn't want to kill her and he can't really marry her at this point, and he really can't trust her at this point. And so he is a just man. We find that in verse 19, very important. He is an upright man. God has chosen not only a man who has the right lineage, but he is an upright man. And he does not want to make her a public example. 
He's merciful, he's kind, and so he's going to put her away secretly. He's just going to probably somehow just say, I'm sorry, it didn't work out, and I'll be praying for you. And how sad that's going to be. All the expectations, all the joy that they had had, the, the, man, the, the things they shared about what they wanted to do, how many kids are we going to have, and all of that. And so he's deliberate, he's careful. Let's read with verse 20. I didn't, okay. But while he thought about the, these things, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. So he's thinking about this. He's not rash. He is not running around telling the whole neighborhood what she has done. He's no doubt uh, introspective. He's no doubt deeply grieved over the situation. But he's deliberate and he's thoughtful. <coughs> and that's an important thing to have. If you're going to get a husband or you're going to have a father, you hope that person is thoughtful. And he's merciful. Uh, he's merciful. Uh, he's not rash. He's not uh, crazy. He's thinking about what to do uh, with the limited options that he has. Stone her to death, put her away privately, Dreams dashed, no home to be built anymore, um, all of our future plans down the drain. But he's thinking, and no doubt praying, and he's upright. But while he thought about these things, now it's time for God to get on the scene. I remember once the late Pat <coughs> Robertson said that big decisions and events require big guidance. Big decisions require big guidance. When you've got a major decision to be made, Call on God for big guidance. Lord, I need it in capital letters and hopefully he can with confirmation. Do that. You might go out there in Florida when you go back home to Florida and look up in that sunny sky. Think of me up there. Write it up look, in the sky. And you'll see a little sign. There's your answer, and it'll tell you. Because <laughs> they do that all the time. <laughs> so we need, we need big guidance. We need an angel to come down from heaven to speak to this man. While he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, and God's going to speak to this man, and God is going to lead this family, not through Mary, but through Joseph. God is going to lead this family through the male leadership, even as he did Adam and Eve, even though Adam messed up and listened to Eve adversely in that situation. But he's going to give all the directions to the man, and that is the way it should be when that man especially knows the Lord, and this is a godly man. So while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, there it is, that's his qualification. You are a son or a descendant of King David. That's what's important to God, among other things. We've seen his mercy, we've seen his patience and deliberation here, and his, obviously his godliness, and open to hearing from God, but he's the son of David. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. What an incredible announcement that is. Don't be afraid. Everything is on track. God's in control. Mary is going to be your wife. And that which is conceived, we don't know if it's a male or female yet, <coughs> that which of this child is going to be conceived in her, and it's of the Holy Spirit. And the word conceived means begotten. This is not a human birth. There was no other person involved, no man involved. This is a divine, divine uh, uh, conception. And she shall bring forth a son. Now we know it's going to be a male. She'll bring forth a son, and the capital S in most Bibles, because he is the son of God. And he's going to have a name. You're not going to call him Jerry or Pete or Sam or Mike or Joe. <laughs> he needs a name that's going to be very important, and that name means... Savior, the Lord is Savior. <coughs> Jesus is the is uh, the Jesus in the Greek. Uh, uh, transliterates from the Hebrew Jehovah, uh, uh, actually Jehovah Shua or Yahweh Shua. The Lord is our Savior. The name means He is our Savior. Jesus is Savior, and He will save His people from their sins. That's the announcement. That's who Jesus is. Now let's read verse 22. 
So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. So now Matthew, writing as a Jew to the Jews about a Jew, is giving a prophecy here from Isaiah, from the Old Testament. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled. Here is one of the fulfillments of the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. Uh, This is the prophet Isaiah speaking, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Jesus is God with us. Now look at Joseph, another characteristic, verse 24. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Another quality you see about Joseph here in verse 24 is that he is obedient. When you look at the people in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, male, female, Those who are successful are those who obey. They wait for God to speak, and when he speaks, they fulfill it. So Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. He did as he was commanded. And the Bible says in Samuel, 1 Samuel, right, to obey is better than sacrifice. That's right. I said that regarding Saul. My late mother used to say, it helps as a Christian not to be too bright. It helps as a Christian not to be too ambitious. Don't be too bright. Just do what you're told to do. Sometimes it doesn't... Don't be too ambitious. Just do what God tells you to do. Yeah, because... And what he tells you to do might be different than what he tells me to do. Although he's never going to break his law. He's always going to want us to do what is right and good and holy in his sight. But... He's, um, he's creative. I, I have to say, God, the Lord is very creative, and he's a detailed working God. Mm-hmm. He knows the details of every one of our lives. That's right. So the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he did it, and he took to him his wife. Now, I don't know the time frame here, but I'm suspecting that he hastened the, the one-year period. It might have been close to a year anyway, but probably not. My guess is that he went ahead and consummated that marriage immediately as far as the legality of it. Went to the elders and said, we're doing it today. And he would have to explain why today. Right. You haven't waited a whole year, Joseph, etc. We're doing it today. That's just a guess. Oh, wow. That's when, true. When I speak outside of Scripture, I always tell you, this is not in Scripture. And I wish others would do that as well. But uh, I'm just guessing that he... I'm trying to get a picture of Joseph here and why God chose this man. We focus in on Mary, and she is a wonderful example of so many things. But don't forget Joseph. He was very special. He did not know her. They did not come together physically until she had brought forth her not only son, her firstborn. So with all of our Catholic brethren, with all due respect, he was not, she was not a perpetual virgin uh, yeah. at that point. She had children. Not. In fact, two of them wrote epistles in the New Testament, right? Who were they? James, James and Jude, right? And so she didn't bring forth... Uh, Uh, She didn't uh, know him, he didn't know her until she brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name, just as he was told to, Jesus. So this is the birth of Jesus as Matthew is doing it. And again, he's talking to Jews and he's giving the lineage. He's saying to the Jewish people, look at all of your kings and all of those in line of kingship after the Babylon, including this man, Joseph. And look at how Jesus comes from that line. He is entitled to be king by lineage, by heritage. And it was prophesied in verse 23. And read that again, would you dare? Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And so he would say to the Jews, this fulfills prophecy, and we're off to a good start. He'll talk to them about the whole chapter, of 28 chapters here. He'll go over and over more verses about this. He's appealing to the Jews to give their heart to the Lord. There are many Jews that we know in our own lives pray for their salvation. My, my, my dad, as I said, was an Orthodox Jew who became an atheist, who became the head of the Christian Science Church and eventually became born again and the pastor here in this church. Jews can be converted. Dad said, you know how you witness to a Jew? like you do to a Gentile. 
they're sinners, they need salvation, they need grace, just talk like an ordinary human being to them, yeah. and there and may they be don't, some who will They come. don't lose their Jewishness, and they also don't have to stop celebrating their holidays. And that's right, that's right. And there are, there are many of us, uh, my wife included, who have Jewish blood a little bit. In, in, in them, so... Uh, uh, we have, there are there are none who are purely Jewish or purely African American or poor, purely anything. We all have a lot of stuff in there. And again, for extra credit, go home and look at Norman Rockwell's uh, family tree. You'll get a kick out of that. I remember that uh, looking at that years ago, and that made he he was pretty wise. Yeah. He was telling people back then. Yeah. You need to look at your bloodline. Yeah, yeah, don't, 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 don't think don't you're so, don't think you're so great. Don't don't judge. Our lesson here for chapter one was. Jesus is humanly our Savior and divinely our God. He's our Savior. He's our God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We give you all the glory and all the honor. Father, we ask you to bless your people here now and help them to come closer to you this week. Thank you for bringing them here. Please watch over them. Watch over their families. Keep them safe. Bring them back next week, Lord. We ask you to bless them and give them a wonderful week in you. Help them, Lord, to reach out to someone with the love of you, the love of Jesus, this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat>